Today I'm talking about Chris Weidman's brutal leg injury at UFC 261, Usman versus Masvidal 2, and five critical considerations for his leg surgery and recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? This video is sponsored by Human 2.0, your trusted source for online training in body weight exercise, kettlebells, animal flow, primal movement, and injury prevention. If you're interested in any of those things, then check them out here on YouTube. Hey interns, I'm Dr. Chris Rayner, and I am not your everyday ortho. I teach you about injuries, orthopedic surgery, and medical topics in a way that's easy to understand and entertaining. Today for Orthopedic Rounds, I'm gonna look at Chris Weidman's right leg injury at UFC 261 and give you five critical considerations for his surgery and his recovery. Let's get right to it. Injury alert. This video will contain some graphic footage of the injury, so if you are squeamish, you can skip ahead to the discussion. You have been warned. Chris Weidman was injured 17 seconds into the first round of his fight with Uriah Hall at UFC 261. After only a single punch was thrown, Weidman threw a low kick at Hall's lead leg while the two were in the center of the ring. Hall checked the kick with his upper shin, resulting in a loud snap. Instantly, those in attendance could see that something was wrong. Although Weidman was not yet aware of it, his lower leg was bent at an awkward angle. He had suffered a lower extremity fracture of his tibia and fibula when his kick had been checked. When he stepped back after the kick, there was no support and he fell to the canvas. Referee Herb Dean stepped in to stop the fight and immediately Weidman knew what had happened. Medical staff entered the ring and stabilized Weidman's right leg. Weidman was taken by stretcher out of the ring and subsequently transported to a nearby hospital. He was admitted to the hospital for assessment and after initial imaging, his surgery was planned for the following day. The situation was quite ironic since Weidman had been Anderson Silva's opponent in UFC 168 in December 2013 when Silva broke his lower leg in the exact same manner after Weidman had checked his kick. Immediately after the injury, Silva tweeted out a supportive message to Weidman as he waited for surgery. So, on Sunday morning, as Weidman waits to have his surgery completed, here are five critical considerations that will determine what surgery he has and what his recovery can be expected to be like. Number one, physicians examined Weidman on Saturday evening following his injury and elected to wait until Sunday morning to perform surgery on his lower extremity fracture. This tells us some crucial information about the injury. First, the fracture was relatively simple in nature without too many fracture fragments. Comminuted fractures, or fractures with many fragments, are quite unstable and are usually stabilized quickly to prevent further injury to the bone or the surrounding tissues. It is likely that Weidman suffered a relatively simple transverse tibia fracture and an associated fibula fracture. Second, the muscle compartments were not significantly swollen after the injury since his surgeon elected to wait until the next day. Uncontrolled swelling in a muscle compartment can cause a problem called compartment syndrome, which must be operated on within six hours to prevent death of the muscle and nerve tissue. Number two, generally there are three ways to fix a lower extremity fracture surgically. An external fixator, plate fixation, or an intramedullary nail. An external fixator is a frame that is placed outside the leg and attached to the leg with pins to stabilize the fracture externally. It is not typically used for definitive fixation and is usually replaced by internal fixation when the leg is more amenable to repair. Plate fixation is a form of internal fixation that may be used for definitive or permanent fixation. It is applied at the fracture site directly through a formal incision and spans the fracture site on the surface of the bone. It is secured with a number of screws above and below the level of the fracture. Intramedullary nail fixation is another type of internal fixation that may be selected for definitive or permanent fixation. It is inserted away from the fracture site through the knee, but spans the fracture site within the bone. It is secured with a number of screws above and below the level of the fracture. External fixators and stabilization plates are load sharing devices that allow limited weight bearing after fracture fixation. An intramedullary nail is a load bearing device that technically allows full weight bearing after surgery. For this reason, the nail is the optimal choice for this type of tibia fracture. However, if there were several fracture fragments or the fracture was segmental in nature, his surgeon might consider using a fixation plate instead. Number three, given that it is likely that Weidman will be stabilized with intramedullary nail fixation, there are generally two methods of inserting the nail. An intramedullary nail can be inserted directly in the front of the knee underneath the patella at the level of the patellar tendon. 
or it can be inserted above the patella in a suprapatellar approach. Both are equally valid methods of insertion, but the suprapatellar approach gives a more direct, straight path of entry for the nail and for that reason may be less technically challenging. Which method is used is a matter of surgeon preference and experience. In the event that the surgeon elects to use plate fixation instead of an intramedullary nail, the plate can be applied by one of two techniques. Most frequently, the surgeon will make a formal incision that is centered over the fracture, through which a fixation plate is applied. The bone is exposed in the operative field with elevation of surrounding soft tissue away from the bone and the plate applied directly to the bone and secured with screws. In some cases, however, a less invasive skeletal stabilization or LIS technique can be used. Here, a small incision is made at some distance from the fracture site, through which a plate is inserted. The plate is slid underneath the skin to the fracture site and stabilization screws are inserted into the plate using fluoroscopic x-rays percutaneously through small skin pokes. Although more technically challenging than a formal incision technique, this technique is the preferred plate technique because it does not involve elevating soft tissue and the connected blood supply away from the bone. Number four, whether to statically or dynamically lock the nail. After an intramedullary nail has been inserted into the center of the bone, it must be locked with stabilization screws both top and bottom before the fracture can become securely fixed. Static locking secures the screws to the nail rigidly so that there is no movement between the nail and the screws, creating a fixed construct that functions as one piece. This is best for fractures that have multiple fragments where the bone cannot offer any additional support following fixation. Dynamic locking secures the screws to the nail in such a way that the nail can slide up or down relative to the screw, creating a construct that functions as two pieces. This is ideal for fractures that are very simple, where the bones can offer some support after fixation. Dynamic stabilization allows compression at the fracture site after surgery, which aids in the healing of the bones at the fracture site. Sometimes both forms of fixation are performed, but later the static locking screws are removed. This gives the best of both worlds where the fracture is stabilized rigidly initially while healing and then allowed to benefit from compression later on when the fracture can provide some support. What type of stabilization that is used for Weidman will be determined by his fracture configuration and his surgeon's comfort level with the security of his fixation. Given that he is a combat athlete with a fracture that I presume to be relatively simple in configuration, I imagine that his bone density is good and that his reduction will be perfectly anatomic or close to it. In this scenario, I would likely dynamically lock the nail to allow dynamic compression through the fracture, which encourages bone activity and healing. Number five, weight bearing after surgery and when to do so are considerations that are based on the complexity of the fracture pattern, the type of fixation used during surgery, and the security of fixation achieved. Fracture patterns that are more complex with more pieces and more tentative fixation are more likely to be closely guarded with non-weight bearing or partial weight bearing for a period of time when the fracture is stable enough to allow weight bearing to be progressed. Fractures that are fixed with intramedullary rod fixation are more likely to be allowed to weight bear since the nail is a load bearing device. Then are fractures fixed with plate fixation or external fixators. Fractures where the bone quality was very good, where screws had really good bite and there were only a few large fragments are more likely to allow weight bearing of some type following surgery. Fractures where the bone quality was poor or soft and the screws had poor purchase or where there were a lot of fragments are less likely to allow weight bearing after surgery since fixation is likely to be tentative at best. I would expect that following surgery, Weidman would be allowed to weight bear as tolerated with crutches, allowing subjective pain to be his guide. Initially, he would walk gingerly while it was still sore, but then he would progressively load the leg as his pain resolved. If all goes according to plan, he could expect bony union at the fracture site in approximately six to 10 weeks, after which time he could advance his physical therapy and begin to resume training. Surgery was successful. They put a titanium rod through the uh, tibia, through the knee. They go through the knee and they take the rod in. So those are five critical considerations that will determine what surgery Weidman has and what his recovery can be expected to be like.
If you think that I missed an important factor, be sure to let me know in the comments and tell me why you think it was important. Otherwise, if you like the video and you want to see another one, then let me know that down below too. Thanks for watching and I will see you for rounds next week. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. Just a fish wound.